is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This episode number 633. My name is Marshall. I'm one of your limited resources. And joining me on the line all the way from, did you say a little snow might be coming in Denver, Colorado with Louis Scott Vargas? Yeah, yeah. It is currently snowing. It's coming down now. And uh, this is a perfect timing for today's show. That's right. Because, of course... <laughs> We are dipping our toes back into the past once again. This time, it's a little chilly in the pool. We've got Ice Age and Alliances revisited here. And of course, that means that we've brought on our return guest for these purposes. It's the Ben Sec TBS. Welcome back to LR. It's nice to see you, bud. How are you? Yeah, it's, 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 it's been great. Happy New Year to everybody. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I've, we've put this off for a while. We've been wanting to really go back into some of these history episodes. So I'm really mm -hmm. excited to, to, to kind of like talk with you about this, this set, which is like one of the first sets that I've really played, start playing a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. This was uh, right, right in my wheelhouse ice age. And then also the subsequent set from it. Alliances is what we're going to talk about on the show today. We're going to be going back, talking about game mechanics, talking about what the world was like then when it came out for us, magic players and uh, it should be a fun trip down memory lane. Before we get into our main topic, let's mention our sponsors. First up, Channel Fireball. Make sure you check out CFB really for anything that you're looking for magic related. As we've talked about before, you know, they switched over to a, uh, a marketplace setup. So if you're looking for singles, you now can go over there and uh, they will show you singles search results from all of the vendors that work with Channel Fireball. So it's not just the inventory that they have in their warehouse. Instead, now you're looking at the inventory from a whole bunch of different vendors, which gives you a lot of flexibility as a consumer. It means you can pick, say, the grading, the best price, you know, maybe the shipping, the, the, you know, how many stars or whatever the, the vendor has, whatever it is that you prioritize the most, then you can, you can buy from them and it gives you that flexibility, which is really great. Of course, there's also CFB Pro if you're looking to kind of up your, strategic game. And, you know, like if you're here listening to LR, that's probably on your mind on some level. Um, you know, one of the best ways to do it is, is through the premium stuff over at CFB, CFB pro. And, uh, that gives you access to articles and videos and stuff from some of the best players in the world teaching you how to play magic. Uh, if you do pick up anything over at CFB, if you use the affiliate code LR at checkout, it lets them know that we sent you and uh, we certainly appreciate it when you do so. Show's also brought to you by FTX. That's the place to go to manage all of your digital assets. We're heading into kind of a brave new world here with blockchain technology leading the way. And if you're uh, interested in, in getting into that, w whether it be through crypt cryptocurrencies or NFTs or things like that, uh, you need a place to manage them. You need a place to buy, sell, trade these types of digital assets. And uh, FTX is the best one. They're safe, they're regulated, and uh, they're trustworthy. They're a place you can go to manage any of those digital assets. If you're inside the United States, it's FTX.us. And if you're outside, it's FTX.com to, uh, to dip your toe in. Now, I will remind you, of course, that this is a form of investment and you should always consult an investment professional before doing investing of any kind. Show's also brought to you by you via the Patreon. It's patreon.com slash limited resources. Every person that signs up on the Patreon, no matter what level, gets a thank you card and an LR sticker in the mail and uh, you get access to the Patreon feed uh, at any level as well. And then there's levels that go up and you get some cool little perks as well. We want to thank, uh, genuinely thank everybody over at the uh, Patreon for their support. It's patreon.com slash limited resources. Now, one of the other things you get as a patron of any level is you get access to the, uh, to the Patreon feed, which is where we put questions like our Patreon question of the week thread. This one comes from Sam who says, Hey guys, love the show. Curious about the impact of the ways to rummage or loot has on splashing. Sometimes I feel I can get away with fewer mana sources to splash a card if I have some ways to rummage it or loot it away when it's uncastable. Do you ever do this? So TBS, we'll start with you. Do, do you, uh, you know, when you're drafting, if you have ways to sift through your deck, you know, via rummaging, looting, or, or similar effects, are you more likely to take risks on splashes and stuff? Uh, uh, it, it kind of, it's a little... I, I would say that it kind of depends on the card you're splashing. If you're if playing something that um, is either quite late game um, and you need, you know that at some point in, during the game, like you can just put it together. Um, I, I think having a couple of rummaging outlets 
will, will actually kind of like help you reduce the amount. You, you, you can kind of say, I'll only have like one source and one, you know, splash bomb uh, with that. But if the splashes is like one involves like more than one, um, more than one card, I actually think that I'm actually more likely to keep the mana relatively similar because a lot of times when you have one more than one card, you can have more than one card in your hand at the same time. And so there's a lot of time pressure to actually kind of be able to play all your spells at a reasonable mm. amount of time. Because like if you have if cards in your hand, you can't play. That's, that's really tough. And you actually don't have that much extra time to wait for your mana. Again, it kind of depends on the cards. I think if you're just talking about kind of some late game thing and it's like game ending, because a lot of times you'll you'll splash a card that's like so good that it's going to end the game. I think you can kind of like use rummage effects to kind of like really restrict, like, you know, let's say a fireball in, in, in this case, like you can have one mountain, one fireball and, and, and probably be okay if you have a lot of other stuff going on in your deck. What do you think, Luis? Do you, uh, do you up that risk tolerance with looters? Yeah. I mean, looters or really any card draw looting, rummaging, Whatever. I mean, I've <laughs> I, I, I've called divination the blue Kadama's reach, and uh, <laughs> what, what what I mean by that, besides just nonsense, is uh, it's easier to splash cards both in terms of finding those cards or finding the color or whatever if you draw more cards. If you see more cards in your deck, it, you do clearly need less sources, right? If you're like, well, I need three sources to splash <laughs> this one card in a deck with heavy card draw, you can go to two. One one thing that I think is worth keeping in mind is. The more it's card draw, the more this applies. The more it's looting and rummaging, the more you'll find yourself in a situation where it's like, okay, if I rummage away this mountain in my blue-green deck because I need to do this to like get, keep get my card flow going, I might not be able to play any red spells I draw. I've got to have a plan for those as well, whether that's more rummaging or looting or just I hope I don't draw red cards for a couple turns till I find my second mountain, which is not an invalid plan, but is something that you, you do have to have to consider. Yeah, it's always I, I definitely <clears throat> uh, factor those in. Uh, they're not a huge factor. They don't let you get away with murder, but definitely they let you get away with a little bit more. I mean, there's a lot of upside, you know, to having uh, a splashable bomb, especially of the vein that the TBS described the type that are late game kind of, you know, game ending bomb, rather than like efficient well-timed removal, something that is just costs a lot, but wins you the game. And you could just easily rummage or, or loot that away for value. I mean, you're actually getting the card back, right? So it's like, you know, that's an upside where normally all your other cards are like, well, I could cast this, but I might go for something slightly better. Here's a card you can't cast at all. It's an easy decision to, to get rid of it. Um, great question, Sam. Um, <clears throat> that's a, a good nuance take a good nuance question for us limited players. Okay. Let's get into the main topic, fellas. Um, we're talking about a really heavy hitter. Um, Ice Age and its companion set alliances today. We're going to go back in time and revisit this set. We're going to go into the ins and outs of how it was made, what impact it had at the time and, and in going forward and all of that stuff uh, on our game. But I'll tell you, um, you know, for my, my personal magic journey, Ice Age was a big thing. It was really, um, you know, one of the sets that was out when I was playing the most in my first foray into magic. So this is what I'm definitely looking forward to as, uh, as Ice Age had a big, big impact on magic. It was a huge set that came out when magic was at its, one of its early first sort of peaks of popularity. And, uh, it's going to be really fun to, uh, to put on our coats and, and visit some Ice Age here. So let's talk about Ice Age. Um, who wants to, who wants to jump in first on the big picture stuff for it? Yeah, I, I can jump into the big picture stuff. So, I mean, Ice Age is really, really important, like for a lot of structural m magic reasons. I, I mm -hmm. actually think as we go on a bit later, you'll find the cards are actually less, a bit more underwhelming. But the impact, I think, in how uh, game magic is kind of structured from a set design perspective and from a block uh, perspective is like really, really important. So, um, it came out in, I believe, actually, I actually want to find. It came out in '95. Yeah, in, in 95, and actually, this is actually kind of like the height of like one of the early waves of like players coming into the game. Um, a lot of players were, were, were coming in. They actually had a, a little bit of kind of like a, like a, a shortage of cards in, mm. in the early expansions, and Ice Age actually was a way to actually kind of like really get everyone started. And it's the first expansion that's kind of classified as a big uh, base set expansion. And what I mean by that is 
it has a lot of like nuts and bolts or even reprints that actually kind of like structurally allow you to play this uh set as a standalone so like really has disenchant it has like you know creature removal at common it has like curves of creatures you know it, it it has also a lot of like mechanical kind of like um interactions between cards so it really kind of like was the first set where I think they really kind of structured it almost like spreadsheet styles. Like, okay, we need some of this, some of this, some of this to make sure that the the set itself actually had had some sort of coherence. If you were playing it basically as your first magic expansion and you didn't even own any cards from a core set or anything else like that. So you could yeah. you go ahead, Louise. I was just going to say, this was definitely in, in, in a lot of ways, like the most well-organized set, you know, the, we, we one of the one of the big talking points about like legends, for example, is it only has one red common creature that can attack. That kind of stuff wouldn't doesn't happen anymore. And part of the reason is that there, there's a much more organized view of like, hey, let's make sure our card counts are good. Let's make sure we have an, enough cycles. And the Ice Age was really big on cycles. They had a ton of these. It broke some good ground with reprints. You know, they had a lot of reprints in the set, which as we've seen is a, is actually a positive. You don't need to reinvent the wheel every single time. Having reprints is a good way to fill out the set with cards you know accomplish what you want them to accomplish. And it can be really fun to have reprints happen in a set where now the reprinted card has new context. So Ice Age was like a success in a lot of those ways. But as as we get to the cards, you'll see that they, there was a lot of misses in the cards, a lot of misses. Yeah, it's yep. interesting because I think that Ice Age is a is a great uh, checkpoint in the early sets of Magic to see. Um, to me, it, it it represents exactly the crossover where it's definitely looking forward, right? Where world building and things being more coherent on an individual set or block basis where, you know, kind of there's a theme that the, you have uh, different card types represented, like you guys just described where there's no big holes where it's like, Oh, well we just forgot to put in a way to destroy an enchantment like whoops, you know, or we just didn't make any creatures that could attack for this color. Darn it. Right. That stuff's behind us. Now they're looking at it in terms of world building. And if we build this little world or a block, right, this plus alliances, in this case, um, to stand alone as a, a set that you could play. That's where magic was going, right? Like that's where we're still at now. And for the bulk of magic, it was that sort of three set arc that would make up a block, but it very much still has magic's early warts in its very near rear view mirror, right? It has not fully transitioned into, okay, we really understand how we're going to be doing these blocks, what we need to account for that. It, it has the very basics of that, but think of the landscape when ice age came out, right? It was stuff like legends and the dark and some of the ones that we've done recently that were really a mess, right? They, they were incoherent and they had huge gaps and they weren't really designed to be standalone anyway. They were designed to be in addition to the card pool that already existed. And therefore they had a lot of misses with the card designs because they had, you know, they, they weren't really like filling out a list. They were just sort of making random stuff. And you definitely see elements of that in ice age as well. Yeah, they they actually considered releasing Ice Age as a different game. As in, mm. I know we've talked in previous uh, podcasts that Arabians had a different back. Ice Age actually, they again reconsidered whether they wanted to actually have a different back for Ice Age because they were saying, "Hey, maybe we should actually make kind of magic very seasonal." As in, I I you you play the Ice Age kind of like set of sets, and then you play, you know the future kind of blocks and, and, and have them completely stand alone in that way. Um, I think, you know, as hindsight has probably told us that was a bad idea and luckily they didn't do that, but I think how they've, they, they made the set kind of is still reminiscent of that thinking. Um, the, the set, as we said, has a lot of uh, nuts and bolts. Um, it has kind of a, a, the narrative coherence, actually. It's actually one thing, I think, compared to Legends or Dark or something like that. I actually think there's a much, much tighter, like, world building and, and, and narrative. It's actually, um, in theory, it's the aftermath of what happened in the, in the Brothers War from a story stand, standpoint. Um, but regardless, the, the, the cards kind of interact with each other. You see the same characters, like, uh, 
referred to in in flavor text you see some kind of like uh you know you hear about some planeswalkers actually there's a lot of planeswalkers mentioned in ice age that actually you know it's before planeswalker was obviously a, a card type and you'll see them actually as planeswalkers in the future okay yeah see that's extra cool well, what what is the overall setting for this set if you were to describe it very cold cold right <laughs> i mean they really did try to say like almost in most simplest terms like what if we took magic the magic world right now and dumped a bunch of snow on it like wh what would have happened and right i mean i know that's a little basic but i mean the the art certainly seems to be that that's what's happening here well luckily snow covered <coughs> is is basic so um you you're right there um <laughs> no so so one of the the overarching mechanics i really try to push with ice age was uh, snow covered um, which is uh, for the judge judges out there is it's a super type, which means that it actually kind of like it's a layer above kind of the, the, the card types themselves. So mm -hmm. um, it's it's it, anyway it, it, it's there to kind of be something you tr you track as a player is just like oh I can sacrifice these snow covered permanents or I can pay with uh, I don't know if you can pay with snow covered mana in this set, but um, basically there's a lot of like snow covered tagging that's happening within the set. Um, I would say that it's relatively unsuccessful with this mechanic, but it's clearly resonant in a certain way. I mean, there's been multiple sets that they actually kind of have modern sets that actually use snow covered. Again, I don't know if it's one of the strongest um, game mechanics that magic has, but it's very resonant. Yeah. yeah it's, mm -hmm. it's definitely one of the coolest mechanics. <laughs> like, so there's been what, three sets with snow. It's been ice age, uh, well, I say alliances, whatever. Uh, Cold Snap and then Kaldheim. Mm -hmm. and, no, MH MH one has it too. Oh, MH one has it too. Four sets, and I think that Kaldheim and MH one are cl clearly like the best designed of those because we have another twenty years of design experience. It, it doesn't reach an A in any of these sets. I think it it's probably a B in the most recent sets and probably like a D in the in the early sets, but. It doesn't matter. I actually still consider Snow a success in Ice Age. I think you, it's kind of hard to not do Snow Covered in some way in Ice Age. Like, it's Ice Age. Like, what, what else are you, where else are you going to do that? Yeah. You know, talking about the mechanics in a slightly bigger picture, Luis, the, this set actually seems to try to tie the mechanics to the cards and maybe even the story together a little stronger than we saw prior, right? We, we would see mechanics pop up, but they didn't seem to be core to the set itself, but this, but it is the case here that, you know, you see, it's a little sad. Again, you, these are initial stabs at these things, but you know, cumulative upkeep is a, is a mechanic that we see woven throughout the set in many different ways, not just a random thing that pops up here or there, right? It's a set that they came up with here, or at least, I don't know if this is the first time it came out. I'm assuming it is. But yeah, and but you see it like a lot, right? And Snow yeah. Covered is another one that they try to weave through. And it really seems like they were starting to hone in on the idea of picking a few mechanics and kind of making that the star of the of the set from a design perspective. Yeah. Yeah. So cumulative upkeep is a is a nice one. So cumulative upkeep so first of all, upkeep costs were something that we that showed up right in alpha, like demonic hordes, where you had to like pay three blue or three black during your upkeep or uh or it went away. Cumulative upkeep it, it is cumulative. So a card that has cumulative upkeep of one blue, like uh, the first one is a, like Arnjot's Ascent. It's a one blue blue for an enchantment, and it, you can pay one mana to give a creature flying until a turn. Cool, right? It's a way to give your guys flying. It has cumulative upkeep blue, which means on your first upkeep after you play it, you spend a blue mana or it's destroyed. On your second upkeep, you spend two blue mana, and so on and so forth. So cumulative upkeep mostly costs one or two mana because anything greater than that obviously just spirals out of control very quickly, but it's not a good mechanic. In fact, it's, I think a quite bad mechanic because cumulative upkeep, like upkeep costs aren't fun and upkeep costs that scale greater and greater. Like, yes, obviously what they're trying to get to is kind of like a fading sort of thing, right? Where like after a certain number of turns, this thing goes away. I don't think fading is one of the more successful mechanics because people generally don't like their stuff going away. I think cumulative upkeep is, is basically the the worst when it comes to that. Like, yeah, yes, it, it, you it get is the worst of all worlds. It is a horrible mechanic, and it's sad that that's the one that is sort of the big keyword headliner. But 
<clears throat> it does show that they're starting to think in terms of putting keyword headliners that allow them to present a set through mechanics TBS. Is that a way, is that a fair way to frame that? Yeah, I, I, I think so. <clears throat> I mean, I, look, just specifically for a cumulative upkeep, it, it belongs to, you know, so, something that you, you may have heard a lot of game designers, or you may have even refer to this in, on this podcast. It's called negative costing. So it's basically a, like, is more of a burden onto on the player playing it. Um, like echoes a negatively costed one. Um, like you know anything that has like an additional like cost to the mana cost. Anyway, th these these mechanics are very designery. What in theory, what you're meant to do is like with these negatively costed cards is you get a more powerful permanent or more powerful spell that, that comes out of it. The th the big problem I think with a lot of these cumulative upkeep cards in the set is that. That's not always true. Like you, you, you're actually sometimes better off just playing like a spell that has no cost, uh, no upkeep cost at all. And so, if you're not actually getting the payoff for all these negative costed things, it's not actually that that fun. On top of it all, as as Louise said, it's not fun to just have your stuff go away after a while. You want it to stay. Yeah, but but what about I, I'm I want to link this though to the idea of. The idea itself of saying, all right, let's pick a few mechanics and weave those into the design language of the set and have that almost be it, you know, this is what this set's about, right? Like we're expressing what we want to express about this set, not through flavor text on the cards or artwork, but through game mechanics. And like before they would do that on an individual card basis. And then maybe you would see a few things pop up a couple yeah. of times. But here, this is their first step into saying, no, no, this is going to be the language that we actually get this across. We're going to pick two or three mechanics, and that's what this set's about, and we're going to show that to you. I mean, yeah. I don't know if cumulative upkeep is supposed to be some analog to melting <laughs> or something, but... I, I, I totally agree. I think this is like the first time that they're doing this a lot. I actually think one of the reasons they are doing this is because they know they, they have a hit on their hands with magic, and they... They want to make sure that the design space, it like is kind of reined in for every given expansion. So like it says, okay, we're going to focus on this because we know that we have we could make a million ideas and put them all into one set. The problem is that if you do that, you kind of like you know you you, you basically you know destroy the the future road that you may be able to kind of expand on. So I think this is actually kind of like a, a design discipline where. You're you're kind of like saying, okay, let's see, let's explore all the space around these particular mechanics, and what that does give is also coherence because there's, you know, once you've learned the mechanic once, you kind of understand it again. So that's another thing that's really really important when when it comes to sets. Also, you can remember sets for reasons. I think one right. of the good things that that actually helps with, um, kind of like you know, Magic has thirty thousand cards or something ridiculous. But the easiest way for me to remember if a card's in a set is it has the mechanic of the set. That's right. And I think that's actually really, really important that that you have these signposts that allows you to kind of like understand here is the environment we've created and you know you can come back to it and 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 not kind of forget what it was all about in the first place. Luis, we see cantrips for the first time in this in this set as well. Yeah, so cantrips, uh, this is named after actually like D&D, &D, like zero level spells, which are basically kind of like little free spells. Every wizard can just cast them, right? Cantrips in Ice Age, the way they did that was they replaced themselves. You draw a card. So you have cards like Heal. It's like one white mana instant, prevent one damage to any creature or player, draw a card at the beginning of the next turn's upkeep. So that's a phrase that persists way too long because it's how it uh, happened in Ice Age, which yeah. is... They thought it would be too good if it drew a card right away. So they tacked on, wait till next turn's upkeep. You have to wait a little bit to get your card. Um, I think the main reason that that's terrible, and I think most people kind of understand that, is you just kind of forget that you're going to you're supposed to draw your card. You have, yeah. Waiting is not very satisfying, et cetera, et cetera. That said, the idea of a class of cards that have a little minor effect and replace themselves, genius. Again, I think we're going to see this a number of times in here in Ice Age, Great ideas, just the execution wasn't there, which is different when we look. We we bag pretty hard on like antiquities, for example, right? Right. Antiquities had a good concept, but it didn't really have like great ideas, and the execution was abysmal. At least Legends was cool. I think it's a little different where it's like they're actually on the right track. So I think it's an important foundational set. It's getting us to where magic is even now, 25 years later. Like look look at now. 
Ice Age has a bunch of different cycles. It has some cohesive mechanics that go with the set's theme. Like, how different are Kaldheim and Ice Age? They have the same, like, kind of theme. They have some of the same mechanics. Kaldheim is much better designed. Like, the details that work better. But Ice Age actually did the right, the right, the right things to the point where a lot of what was kind of discovered or implemented in Ice Age n- kind of persists. And you still see that in sets today. And like TBS said, when you, when you make Alpha – you just put everything that you can find in alpha because you want alpha to be a hit. If it's not a hit, the game is dead. Right. Like you, you, you throw everything at the wall and then you kind of see what sticks for the next sets or whatever. Ice Age was them acknowledging we have a winner. This game is sticking. Ice Age isn't going to like ruin that if we come out too, too low or whatever, but let's try to actually be organized and make it so we can, we're future proofing ourselves and cantrips are a part of that. Cantrips are now in every single set. Every single set, there's cards that draw a card. Of course, they got rid of the whole next turn's upkeep thing because that's nonsense. But this is where they started, and it it worked out really well. There's tons of little minor effects in Ice Age that draw cards that were not only powerful for tournaments, like Barb Sextant was the uh, precursor to Chromatic Sphere. One mana artifact, one tap sack, get any color of mana, draw a card at the next turn's upkeep. Good in tournament decks. It was it, That effect is powerful. And they're fun and pleasing to play. It's pleasing to play little minor effects and draw more cards and play more cards over the course of the game. Um, just a, just a, a quick kind of like his, historical addition. This is actually the f- this first set that was played at a pro level. Um, pro Tour 1 actually has uh, Ice Age cards. And, and I think some of the designs here are a bit of a nod to the fact that they know that they want to pl- make it a tournament-based game. There's a lot of like... Mm. like I would call them skill testing cards, and there's a lot of just ideas that they know that they don't want to power creep too much because they want to make this game feel fairer. And and that's something that you, you see with a lot of the early sets. They, they're really, really worried about like power level because they want to have a sustainable game because they know that, one, they want the game to last a long time, but two, they realize they, they, they're trying to, trying to create a tournament scene. I mean... I, I think I think it was a quarter million dollars for the first Pro Tour, which is a huge amount of money at the time. I mean, it was like it definitely kind of like got me to be serious about Magic, even though I was pretty far away from being able wow, to play wait, that they, level. They were giving a quarter of a million dollars per Pro Tour away in 1995. What what must it have been later? Twenty years later? <laughs> oh wait, no, a quarter of a million. Dollars. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, it, it, I, I think it's really important. It's also uh, important to note it was actually, the, I, I said, it was the first um, first set that was part of a block constructed format, which actually happened at Pro Tour Three. Um, w- w- I'll, I'll kind of talk about it later once we we get to alliances. Um, but I think it's really really important to have a look at the kind of the the meta kind of position of what Magic is. Magic is now starting to become a, a very competitive sport uh, game at this point. And it, I think it's really, really important that they're acknowledging that in the design of the game and in the marketing of the game. Yeah, it's really – you can see <clears throat> the bigger picture concepts coming together. That one that you just mentioned was huge, TBS, with the the fact that they wanted it to be tournament playable and, and especially in a block constructed, you know, meaning that you can only play cards from – that block in this case it would be this plus alliances that means hey you've got a shopping list you need to tick a lot of boxes you can't have a, a card that has no answer for it in the whole set that that just ruins everything so you really do need to make sure that you know there's a series of checks and balances that are built into the set from a power level perspective but you know combining a couple of the points that you guys made earlier as well were handholds right because of course there was still an influx of players coming in to the game as it was growing in, in its you know relative early years here. We're still only a couple of years past its inception. I mean, it came out in 93, but that was when, you know, it was alpha and beta. There were very many cards around at that point. It really took until 94 before, you know, there was cards on the shelves and Ice Age came out in 95. I mean, we're, we're not talking about, you know, well into the run here. This is still very much baby steps, but, you know, they're recognizing, hey, we need to make sure that this game is accessible to people and things like Luis, you mentioned cycles, right? There's groupings of cards that have similar text on them. One for each color is a way to quickly acclimate yourself to like five cards in the set. You go, okay, I know what this does. 
the white one gains life, the blue ones draw me a card, the black one does a creature, you know, okay, cool. And like, you can start to get an idea for those, those routines over and over for each one of the cycles that they would put in. And then, as we talked about before, uh, that you hit on TBS, the fact that like, okay, there's cumulative upkeep as the kind of headliner that shows up on a bunch of cards in this set. Well, now that I know how cumulative upkeep works, even though for the time it was quite a complicated mechanic, um, you know, having to track things turn after turn and that kind of stuff, uh, and people routinely got it wrong. Um, but you know, once you got it, you could put that cost on any number of different cards in different ways. And you could show how much design space there was even just for one mechanic. And I really wonder being in the room for the design of this set, if a lot of this stuff really started to become clear to them about like, okay, we can really slow down and go deep on a mechanic or two for a set because there's a lot of space around each of these mechanics, you know, like even a, fairly boring one, like cumulative upkeep, you there's a lot of different, you know, I wonder what it was like the first time somebody raised their hand and said, wait a minute, let's not have it be mana, let's have it be life, right? Let, let's have it be some other thing that you pay that isn't mana. And oh, wow, we could have cards from your library, we could make you discard cards, we could, you know, and all of a sudden, you realize that there's a whole lot you can play with. And then, you know, somebody's probably like, hey, let's have it where we give somebody else a card with cumulative upkeep. And if they don't pay, they get punished or, oh, cool. And, you know, boom, there's another subset of cards that you can do. And all of a sudden, you know, you start um, going down this track. And that's just on one mechanic. And frankly, it's an awful. <laughs> that's on one bad mechanic, <laughs> you know. So that's Let me read good. you a cumulative upkeep card that's like, th th there's some amazing ones. Uh, this is called Snowfall. It's Tuna Blue. For an enchantment, it has cumulative upkeep of a blue mana. It, it says mm -hmm. islands may produce an additional blue when tapped for mana. This mana is usable only for cumulative upkeep. <laughs> Snow-covered <laughs> islands may produce either an additional blue blue or an additional blue when tapped for mana. This mana is only usable for cumulative upkeep. So <laughs> it's a great. three mana enchantment with cumulative upkeep that makes your snow-covered islands, because if you're going to play this, you're going to play all snow-covered islands, tap for three mana, but you can only pay cumulative upkeeps with it. It's the cumulative upkeep lord that makes all your other cumulative upkeeps easier to, to, to pay for. <laughs> that is absolutely incredible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's like giving you a bank account and they're like, but we're going to give you triple interest, but you can only use it to pay for the fees associated with this bank account. <laughs> that You're is like, exactly Wait, what? what it is. And you know, looking at ice age, I think if anything, it actually is over cycled. It has too many cycles. It actually mm. doesn't, I think have enough kind of standalone, like cool cards. That's, and, a, that's saying a lot. Cause this set has 383 <laughs> cards in it. Oh, it's it got is a, a lot massive of cards. set. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. it's also got lots of like color hoser cycles and the, you know, c allied cycles. Like one of the things it, it actually dipped into gold cards in a pretty cool way where it's got, you know, we're, we're going to talk about the individual cards later, but it's got a, a cycle of gold cards and a cy cycles of cards like mono blue cards that have red activation costs or whatever. Every every color had some of these. Actually, I think it was only allied. But um, yeah, it's only allied. It's actually the first time that they really kind of lean into the allied being better than um, enemy. Um, they showed that with these activation costs. They did it with the, the, the pain lands, the pain lands um, only appeared in allied colors at this stage. Um, I, th I think it's actually really, really important that they kind of like taught the color kind of relationships even more in this set, because I think like, you know, alpha kind of like set it up, but I would say there's a lot of the sets between Alpha and Ice Age kind of like screwed up the color pie more than helped. They it. did. They did. Yeah. Totally. Right. And and so I think I think this is the time it's like, okay, hold on. We've got to kind of go back to what the color pie means. And they were much, much more careful about that. And I think that's a good thing because I think the color pie is like one of the innovations of magic that is like almost unique to magic i wouldn't say it's exclusively unique but you have a look at a lot of other tcgs they don't have that kind of like kind of counterplay between the different uh like uh deck types and i think that's really really important that they decided that okay we're going to lean into it again it's going to be important and we're going to show you why that's what's why that's the case yeah the um speaking i wanted to to hit on the block constructed nature of the sets of these two sets because these 
these uh, were the sets used for the first block constructed Pro Tour, right? Yeah, that was uh, Pro Tour 3 in Columbus, won by Ule Rade with uh, Red Green Spiders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which is just crazy uh, to think about the types of decks that would win back then. I mean, they went from extremely broken to really fair. <laughs> and, uh, and, and Ole en ended up taking that thing down, uh, completely unrelated to that. Um, cheating was very rampant back then, at least what we would describe as cheating now. Um, even at the, the pro tour level though, <laughs> look, I wasn't playing at this level then, so I don't have firsthand experience, but from what I've heard, and you guys can speak to this, um, it wasn't viewed the same way that we would view it now. Like what we would view as blatant cheating was considered, I don't know, impolite or something. I it, it's a little weird. I, yeah, so I, I I guess I'd call it unsportsmanlike. I mean, so like if you're drawing extra cards or you're like tutoring when you're not meant to tutor, those are cheating. That's still cheating back then. It's che cheating now. Like that's clear. I think one of the things that was true of early Magic is that they wanted to have these rules like. Uh, you couldn't play with sleeves um, mm. because they, they they wanted to make sure that the cards that were authentic and like they didn't want to necessarily like I, I think sleeves were just a luxury at the time. Um, one of the things that was true back then though is that a lot of the printing was very very inconsistent between sets, and it was actually possible to kind of identify cards like what set they came from by the back of the cards. The back um, of the card, even though they were all the same design. Yes, exactly the same design, just like either how like faded the, the printing was or sometimes like the the centering sometimes was a, a little off. Um, sometimes the gloss is a bit different. Regardless, like it was actually to, to a trained eye, and I say trained, I just mean like you practiced it. You could tell basically which um, set it was from. And so a lot of players basically looked at, like played basic lands from different sets from the like set that were actually oh. the, the rest of the deck was um, made with. And so it's easy to tell when you're about to draw a land. So and could I you actually tell TBS or is this one of those things that people say, but people couldn't really do uh, it? Easy. It, it was easy. I mean, I, oh, man. well, I, I was able to tell like pretty much the first, like, I don't know, dozen sets by their back. And that's really, like, and, that, and, and you know, I, I played with sleeves. I didn't cheat. Uh -huh. I mean, not, not intentionally. Um, <laughs> yeah, but well, it, was, it, it, was, it was definitely something that people did, and it was, it was like it was well known too. Where once you've learned how to do this, it's kind of hard not to do it. If your opponent is sitting there with their hand of three cards, and you're like, "Wow, they've got a card from Ice Age in their hand," I guess it's probably Pyroblast because that's what they're that's the card from Ice Age they have in their deck. Like, I, I'm not saying that this was a great thing for Magic, but I can completely understand how people ended up in a spot where like. I mean, I, I remember a friend playing at uh, the Urza Saga Draft Pro Tour. So this is a couple years after Ice Age still. And he tried to get the head judge to make it a requirement that everyone use sleeves. And he said, look, I know how to tell what all the, the sets are from their back. So it'll be easy to tell when you're drawing lands or not or, you know, which set your cards are coming from. And the judge is like, well, we're not going to require everyone use sleeves. That's just not something we can do or want to do. Okay. And in that world, what are you supposed to do? Yeah, I don't know. Especially if other people are, you know, like if it's the standard that everybody can tell what's going on, I you then well, you're, you're effectively putting yourself behind by not. I think it's everyone who knows what's going on. So there's going to be a lot of people playing at every event who has no idea this is part of the range, yeah. which is why I think it's kind of bad. Like I don't think any of anyone yeah. thought it was like a great thing for Magic. It shouldn't be testing how well do you know card backs. It should be testing how well do you play the game. But it's hard to talk about Ice Age or any of these old sets, especially in the context of, hey, this was the first block constructed set. This was the first Pro Tour involved Ice Age without kind of acknowledging the fact that the players who were really skilled back then did know all these things. Yeah, that's like, crazy. A different world for sure. Um, reprints. Is, is this our first time seeing reprints like this in a in an expansion set? Yeah, I, I, yeah. There, there was reprints in revised, obviously, but that's not an expansion set. It was just kind of like a, mm -hmm. a core set. And this is the first time they really did kind of like not just reprints, quite a lot of reprints, and nearly all staples because they wanted to make sure that like a lot of the bases were covered and they did. And they, as I said, they, they're very aware of tournaments. 
so they didn't necessarily want to make more of the same card to do to do the same thing. What's an example of like a staple reprint that, that we would see? Well, so um, Counterspell was reprinted, mm-hmm. um, Source to Plowshares, Disenchant. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, yeah, so really, truly staple baseline cards for their color. Yeah, I mean, th- th- there's a, like Dark Rituals reprinted. This was a time where Dark Rituals was very much like part of the black identity. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's really, really important. And also what they did was like, even if they didn't do a reprint, sometimes they realized that like some of the older cards were too good. So what they did was a new version. And this is something we do all the time, but like Incinerate, um, which is like one, uh, uh, in, I think most people know Incinerate, but it's one red and one. It's a in, uh, instant that basically does three damage to a creature or a player and they can't regenerate is basically meant to be a replacement for Lightning Bolt, which they mm. think they acknowledge was too good at the time. I so see. they're doing a little bit of this kind of like changing like changing the cost. They are changing the effect slightly just to make sure that it doesn't feel like something that's strictly worse. But in general, most of these things are kind of powering down some of the cards that were very powerful in Alpha. That's really interesting. And, and they also were riffing thematically. Right off of these, it wasn't simply a turning the knob of just simply adding a mana, but they actually tried to add some some Ice AG flavor or a different uh, thematic twist to these cards. Yeah, I mean, here's another ex- example. So we all know Hypnotic Spectre uh, from Alpha, which is like, you know, it's a 2-2 two, two for 3 that if it hits you, you discard a card at random. Um, a lot of people perceive that card to be too powerful because, or too swingy because the randomness of the discard was considered kind of like you know, not very skill testing. Mm-hmm. So what they did in Ice Age was they created a card called Abyssal Spectre, which is like a um, s- s- similar creature. It's like a 2-3 flyer for four, black, black, and two. But instead of like having a random discard when it hits, it has a like a chosen by the, the person who gets hit uh, discard, which means that it doesn't feel as swingy. It doesn't feel as unfair. Ag- again, I think I think there was like a very concerted effort to understand what worked in alpha, but also what was too powerful in alpha and kind of like tweak things so, so that it could be sustainable in, in a, in a game that wants to last for years. Yeah. You know, a, a common, you know, another sort of, if you played at the time, this is an obvious tweak on abyssal specter is that is the extra mana, right? It, it was very common for people to go turn one swamp dark ritual hypnotic specter. That was a thing that people like to do. And and this takes that play off the table as well. So really interesting to see them start to grasp power level. What's too good. What, you know, just the idea that they understood to add a mana for incinerate and give it a slight bump, but really just by doubling the mana that that would actually fix lightning bolt, you know, really starts to show, okay, they know what's up, right? They, they understood subtleties like that. Um, another thing that shows up in ice age for, I believe the first time are, uh, dual lands with drawbacks. Luis, we had the original duels, you know, going back to alpha, but this is the first time that we see what ends up being, I mean, how many versions of dual lands with drawbacks do we have now? You know, there's probably 30 or something. I mean, there's a million of it. It seems like every other set has something like this. And, and these are, I believe, the first time that we see these. Yeah, they actually had two cycles, which is funny. They had the pain lands. So these are cards like Adarkar Waste, Sulfur Springs that you might be familiar with, even if you didn't, you haven't been playing that long because they got reprinted and they, they see some play in random like modern or whatever, yeah, which is good. like – they tap for a colorless or they tap for white and blue, white or blue, and you take one damage. And so they had those five because, they again, this they, they hit the allied color pairs hard here. But they also have another cycle, again, of allied duels, Lava Tubes, this cycle, which was mm. tap for black or red mana, and then it doesn't untap for a turn. And what's what's crazy about that is the these don't tap for colorless, so – the fact that they don't tap for colorless and lock you out for a turn if you use them made them much, much worse. And people basically didn't play these once they, people had figured out a little bit about how bad they are. But they wanted two cycles of allied duels in the same set just to really drive the point home. 
Yeah, I, I, I think this is all part of the kind of structure of trying to make people understand color pie. I, like I, one of the criticisms that I, I remember of like early dual lands, like the original duels, is that they basically allowed you to play five colors uh, with no particular cost, like mm-hmm. other than you know, I, I it's not it's not exactly true, but like I, I think people perceived it that way. And so wanting to make the, the playing different colors mattered or had a had a higher cost was really really important, and you could see that here. It's like it says, hey, you can play two colors. But it's going to cost you something on your la- your mana base. I mean, funnily enough, the 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 lava tubes uh, dual lands originally were perceived to be better than the pain lands because people like hated taking damage. They hate it. And so it's, it's like, oh, you know, like this one's like, yeah, what if I don't cast a spell every turn? It's not too bad. Yeah. Um, it, it it was. I mean, I remember having that reaction myself. It was like, ah, uh, like I, I'll I'll play this other one. I'll, I'm not going to. Oh, I had these cards in my deck. We just didn't know what was good back then. I yeah. certainly didn't. That's the thing that I think is is hard to contextualize now is like if you remember when you first started playing, <clears throat> even if that was recently, there's there's certain strategies, certain types of cards that newer players just hate, right? They hate counterspell decks. If you just sit there and counter all their stuff, like they could be ahead and just be like, I give up. I don't care. Like because it feels like demoralizing to have somebody just counter every spell you play, even if you're like. You get a 2-2 two, two for 2 down. You start smashing them for 2 a game. They don't really have an answer for it. They counter your next 5 spells. You just feel like you're losing because you don't understand that dynamic yet. Um, land disrupt, land destruction is another one. Hand disruption is another one that, that TBS uh, touched on for the Hypnotic Spectre thing, right? These are things that are psychologically much and, and taking damage are much, much more um, outsized to your brain than they are to the actual outcome of games. And people just didn't know that stuff yet, right? I mean, people played life gain constantly. They loved it. It feels so good to game life. You get that warm, fuzzy feeling like I'm safe. I'm, I'm doing things. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm playing the game. I'm, I'm at 23 life. Okay. I'm really good. You know, and they just, the, the, the idea of using your life total as a resource was more or less foreign at the time. So yeah, strangely enough, even though they printed what ended up being one of the best cycles of dual lands, Really early here, the pain lands, those are really a good option. You know, uh, they, th- that has to be on the short list of best duels that they've printed. They enter the battlefield untapped and they can tap for any color right away that, uh, you know, that they can tap for. It's really strong, but yeah, it, a lot of people didn't like them for that. One last thing before we get to talking about, um, individual cards, um, anti, um, is this the last <laughs> gasp for anti? Is it still just hanging on here? Because I feel like by this point, nobody was actually playing it. Yeah, I don't think there was that many people playing it. I think that there was still a perception that they wanted to have that option available. Okay. Um, it, it was kind of like a historical relic. Um, and, and and at this time, the tournaments ha- automatically banned anti-cards. Mm. So they didn't feel like it was like a particular kind of pressure on tournaments like it says okay we just you know just don't play this card if you are, are playing in like w- one of the official tournaments um again i don't think anti was actually th- ever that popular no so it, it is interesting that they still kind of persisted here yeah why, why are the, they still here i don't like nobody played it i played back I, then and nobody played anti i think i think that there was some amount of like you know, as Garfield intended going on. Okay, I can't, sure. I, I can't speak to what these designers were thinking, but I can imagine thinking, well, anti is a core rule. You know, re, you know, it was an alpha. Richard Garfield seemed to think it was pretty important. We don't know the science behind this, how, what this game ticks so much that we're confident we can remove anti cards. Though, looking at alliances, there weren't any anti cards in alliances as far as I can tell. So... Ice Age, I think, was just about the last gasp of that. I mean, I guess Chronicles reprinted some of those, but I don't remember exactly where on the timeline that was. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, Anti is not a, not that great of a mechanic. In fact, I think it's a pretty bad one. So I'm not surprised people are not 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 really getting into Anti and then not playing it so much after this. Though there are a couple Anti cards. Uh, if you want to, <laughs> like like let's talk about Amulet of Quas. It's a uh, six mana artifact. <laughs> You have to remove it from your deck if you're not playing for anti. You pay zero, tap, and sacrifice it. Flip a coin. It's just hitting all the benchmarks right away. Oh, my God. (laughs) Coin flipping antis? 
Target opponent calls heads or tails. If the flip ends up in your favor, that opponent loses the game. Otherwise, wow, you lose the game. And uh, effects that prevent or redirect this damage cannot be used to prevent this loss of life. Weird, because there's no loss of life there, but I guess they interpreted <laughs> losing the game as going to zero. Uh, <laughs> you can use this ability only during your upkeep. And we're now getting to the anti-card. At the end of this gigantic text box, your opponent may anti an additional card to counter this effect. Oh my, <laughs> this is just insane. They can double or nothing. But it makes no sense too, because you have to pay a six mana artifact, survive to your next upkeep. If they're losing the game, they'll just take the coin flip, right? Yes. If they're winning the game, they can anti an additional card, but you're probably now losing pretty badly because you spent six mana on an artifact that did nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. <clears throat> that's horrendous. And also, uh, you know, Probably shows why we uh, ended up walking away from from anti for many reasons. <laughs> okay, um, let's get into individual cards here, <clears throat> stuff that sh- that stands out. And you know, I want to start with the biggest hitter, uh, the card that I think of the most. I wonder if you guys are the same. Um, from from Ice Age is Necropotence. Just boom, right off the top. That's the the visual that I see. That's the card that I think of. Um, what is that true for you guys too? I mean, it, it certainly is the most powerful card in Ice Age. I think I think it, it's pretty inarguable. I know we had a discussion kind of prior to the the whether um, Brainstorm was actually more powerful, but I do think uh, ultimately. Well, let's have that discussion the, here. We don't want to cut out okay. the, the listeners. Well, I, I think that I think that we're all on the same page that Necro is the most powerful card. I think where it gets a little interesting is Brainstorm. I think has had quite a bigger impact on magic as a whole than Necro. Though Necro did dominate in, you know, early tournaments a lot. Brainstorm's just gotten 20 years of getting to to play in Legacy and Vintage and, yeah. you know, Commander as well. Like that's I think Brainstorm's probably a much more popular card than Necropotence. No, but, and, and but Brainstorm, Necro Brainstorm, was like an absolute yeah. house, you know, well, back in the day. So, so what's crazy about it is it made it famously inquest lists of worst cards in the set. Yes. Oh, the Inquest magazine? Yes. yes. In- oh Inquest my every, God. every month. Yeah. Every month Inquest like basically had magic card. Like it, was, it was a card uh, pricing uh, magazine and they would, you know, rate these sets and Necro was on their bottom, bottom cards of the set. And honestly, most people agreed with them for a long time. Like a lot of players who kind of like looked at magic, kind of like a level one magic, like this card looks not good. I mean, like for the for, for people who who are not familiar with Necro, it's black 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 for an enchantment. Now here's the text: Skip your draw phase. If you discard a card from your hand, you have to remove it from game, or you have to exile it. Zero, pay one life, and you put aside the top card of your deck. Um, and at the, at the beginning of your end step, you put all the cards that you've put aside into your hand. So one of the things you could do is like you could just basically refill your hand like very very easily um uh, funnily enough in some some later decks i had necro it was actually correct to necro as much as you had life like you just necro for 18 because you could actually just kill them like in your in your instep Mm. for for, for, like with with a combo or something like that like it was it was that powerful and and when you think about it like the raw amount of cards you can get from this card like it's it's definitely not surprising that this is like a, a card that's like had such an impact. I mean, I remember opening Necro in one of the the first packs I opened of Ice Age, along with Soul Devi Golem. It's that's a four mana five three that doesn't untap, but you during your upkeep you can untap one of their creatures to untap it. And I remember thinking like, wow, this card's awesome, but this rare I got is garbage. I got this, like, you have to skip your draw step and then you have to pay life to draw cards. Now this looks, this looks terrible. Uh, obviously once you think about it or see it in play or even just like apply kind of a slightly more advanced thinking to it, it's like, oh, Necro is just busted. I think the, 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 the decks that really got their start with Necro weren't even the combo decks. That was like a later innovation. It was basically Dark Ritual, Necro. Like the Pump Knights from Fallen Empires that we talked about, like the Black Black Two Ones, and like you know Nevenroll's Disc, and basically just kind of like black mid range that just use Necro as 
a three mana draw spell that would just refill their hand to seven every turn. Yeah. yeah. And they had life gain built into it to, to help. Yeah. Some had you could get tower, necro locked life, if you, whatever. Yeah. Cause if yeah. you, if you got low on life, you could get, they called it getting necro locked, right? Yeah. No, no. I mean, like a lot of the early decks either played drain life. Um, some of the, uh, more kind of like, like when, uh, there's a psychic came out that was corrupt, uh, mm-hmm. was in a necro, necro deck. The, and and the early decks played Nevernal's discs so they could actually destroy their own necro, right? So they could start drawing again. Um, kind of the the most the the, the biggest early deck uh, was played by a play a, I think it's a Swiss a Swedish player called Leon Lindback, and he actually made the top sixteen at Pro Tour one with this deck. It's arguably the best deck at Pro Tour one. It should probably if if you were drafting like you know, from the top 16 decks from, from that tournament, that deck is the most advanced has the most like going on. That is like powerful from a, from a modern perspective. A lot of those early decks, garbage, total garbage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Necro also a valuable lesson for magic, from magic design perspective that they would um, reluctantly only reluctantly learn over the years, which is, you know, when you can take one resource in magic and turn it into another with no, cost in between that can be very dangerous right life into cards in this case well they they, they learned their lesson pretty well and they printed yagmas bargain which was also broken yeah you know? <laughs> <laughs> say that that didn't teach them i mean all the way you know this isn't just life and cards right like i mean i would go i would say all the way to phyrexian mana right where you can t- turn life into mana like that that was broken too. <laughs> like anytime you can take, you know, cards in your library and turn them into life or, you know, it's just like anytime we see these interactions happen, uh, usually people will find a way to break them. And, and Necro is certainly one of them. What, what other cards stand out to you guys from the set? Just as we kind of go down the list. One of my favorite cards is actually in this set. Um, it's also a triple black spell. Funnily enough, uh, it's called pox. Uh, oh yeah. Players, people who have played more recently, um, may, no smallpox this is actually the granddaddy of that card um so it's black 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 sorcery um each player loses a third of their life rounded down then discards half uh, a third of their hand in cards rounded down and then sacrifices a third of their creatures uh rounded down or round up sorry all this is all round i was gonna say the fact that it's rounded up was actually really important as well yes uh because a lot of times you'd actually like cast this like you know, turn one, um, after you dumped all your hands of moxes and stuff like that, you'd, you'd go, you know, dark ritual pox. So it would actually kind of like affect your opponent more because, mm. um, artifacts were actually, um, one of the categories that were, that was thirded. Um, I, I thought this card was like so cool for, for all the mathy reasons that I was a nerd back then. Um, or not, not, not just back then, but <laughs> also back then. I was going to call you on that, but you know, no good. good <laughs> but I, I, I thought it was this really cool that you could kind of break the symmetry on this card by like understanding kind of what it's trying to do. And, and it's pretty cool in that way. What about you, Luis? What are, what are some of your standouts? One, one of the things that I think they did a really good job of is reprinting a lot of staples like counterspell, you know, swords to plowshares, disenchant, and then printing like Brainstorm, which became a staple, Dark Ritual, all these cards. But there's some really interesting cards. Uh, Deflection was one of my early favorites. This is three and a blue for an instant. Change the target of target spell to another target. Oh, and yeah. That's it was the first like, misdirection think. kind of card. Mm-hmm. And this, this this card was one that was like fairly popular. I remember it being a, a sought-after card back then. I think it, it was worth like 10 bucks, which is a lot for a card back then. Mm-hmm. Um, most most cards weren't didn't get nearly that that high, and I remember trading in deflections, jester's caps, and jester's masks to get a mox emerald. So jester's cap and jester's mask were, I believe, the two most expensive cards in the set. Um, hey, we got to talk about those. You can't just run right over jester's cap here. Now. I was literally about to say them. They're, like, they're, come they're, on, give it it's give a, it its due a respect. Artifact. It was on the box. Pay, four mana artifact <laughs> that you could pay two tap and sack it to look through your opponent's deck and exile three cards. And this was mind blowing. So broken. This was such a cool card because <laughs> it actually is the kind of card that, first of all, hits the note everyone loves. Like how many different surgical extraction, cranial extraction, lobotomy, jester's cap type cards that there been in Magic? Infinite because people love them, and because they strike at 
the bad guys. They strike at the combo decks. Oh, you're playing that combo deck that has one one drain life or one fireball as your only win condition? Boom, get Jester's capped. Yeah. yeah. Also, this is back then when people thought going through and taking out three of your opponent's short swords to plow shares was just a huge advantage. Yeah. In a little bit of defense of like people's <laughs> perceptions back then, um, one of the earliest kind of like dominant decks, um, and this was in vintage or type one at the time, was the 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 deck called, funnily enough, the deck, um, mm. and it it was basically a, a, a control deck that won with I think one or two um, Sarah Angels. So when this card came out basically people said oh the deck is dead because it, you know if you ever get the cap off they have no more win conditions and they can't beat you and you can deck them because they have three three less cards in the deck um but you know they forgot they neglected to to figure out that like counter spell is still really good against the four mana artifact <coughs> so <laughs> um, yeah. or, or that if they had one sir angel in their hand they would still just beat you with that yeah or that they would just bring guys you to death or a million other things because <laughs> In defense of the people back then, that still wasn't a good plan. <laughs> yeah, it's funny because I don't, you know, like I want to go the opposite way and not defend people back then um, in this way because this was a huge uh, learning time for Matt for Magic players. Like again, you guys described it. Necropotence panned when it first came out, ended up being the headliner card for that entire era of competitive Magic. And when it came to Jester's Cap, when I first was playing that was the card everybody wanted that was really it was the number one card like if you opened up a pack you were like please just give me that gesture's cap one time people were trading them you know for for beta and alpha stuff you know i mean it was the card to get and it is because people thought it was good like it was the tournament staple that was the card that the competitive players wanted it wasn't you know, just for fun or, you know, some casual dragon or whatever. It was like the card. And we just didn't understand yet that taking away the three swords to plowshares from your opponent's deck wasn't even really an effect that was worth a card at all. And it's funny because there are these psychological lessons that have to be learned over time. And we did not know yet that that wasn't an effect worth playing. And it, it came around fairly quickly. I remember that, you know, within a year or something, people weren't really looking for Jester's caps anymore. But that was when things moved really slowly with prices, right? Like, you know, we were talking about Inquest Magazine, and that came out monthly and updated the prices. So these things were a lot more static, and the price memory was a lot more sticky uh, on cards. But even even then, you know, uh, Jester's cap, you know, fell off at some point. But really... I I still look back and just sort of chuckle because, I mean, that was a card I was trying to get my hands on because everybody else wanted it, but it wasn't even good. You know, it wasn't even a good card in in retrospect. I mean, look at Jester's Mask. This was a a five-mana artifact, and uh, it came into play tapped, and uh, you could pay one tap and sack it to look through their – look through their hand and give it – and deck, and then give them a new hand of as many cards as they had before. So – okay. It was a head games with a one turn delay, but yeah, this was still a card people wanted. You could yeah. give them all lands, or if it's early, give them all expensive cards. Oh, <laughs> there you go, tasty. And 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 people wanted these cards, and I. It's hard to describe. I mean, you kind of touched on it, Marshall, but it's hard to describe how the perception of the public kind of went back then. Where, yes, these were the cards people were looking for. These are the cards that were coveted it's not because people had that specific of a reason for putting wanting these cards or you know like tbs i think was a more competitive player earlier than all of us like Mm -hmm. earlier than the two of us yeah uh but even then i think a lot of it is just filtered through there isn't that many people who know what's going on or a good central source of information and you're going to end up in this spot where yeah, people want Jester's Masks. Why? Because it's good. Because it's cool. Who knows? <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, it, I, I I think people are still kind of like falling into the splashiness trap. I think those 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 two cards kind of like at the time were splashy. They did fairly unique things, and they felt game ending in the way that you know some of the more game ending cards feel like right now. But I, I I do think you're right. People eventually got there for most of these things. It just took a bit longer. One. 
um, you know, there wasn't as many people playing. But two, the internet was just not very big at the time. And so, like, things didn't travel very fast. You actually had to hear it from other, someone else that this card was good or you had to see it for yourself in a tournament. And, you know, when that's the way that you have to interface with Magic, the, like, the whole metagame and the whole understanding of Magic changes. And I'm going to kind of, like, you know, show that as an example for Marshall's favorite card. He told us before the, the stream. Um, Polar Kraken. Oh, yeah, I Marshall, love that. Marshall, you don't talk about Polar Kraken? Yeah, man. I, I You know, w th this is uh, also, I think, describes um, early early magic, not just from a design perspective, but from, like, where I was at. Like, this is a 8 blue, 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 eleven, eleven trampling Kraken with really cool artwork from my favorite artist at the time, Mark Tadeen. And the funny part is, though, is that for your 8 blue, 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 yes, 11 mana triple blue cost, you get drawbacks. It enters the battlefield tapped. So you, you can't even block with it the turn the you know on turn nineteen when you play it or whatever, and it has a freaking cumulative upkeep of sacrifice a land. Now that obviously doesn't matter that much when you have an eleven eleven trampler. If it survives, you get to smash a couple of times and your opponent's dead anyway. But come on, it's it's got a freaking cumulative upkeep and you paid eleven mana for the thing, and I loved it. I thought this card was so cool because it was like almost aspirational just to get it on the battlefield. It was, I think it's the biggest creature at the time. Mm. Uh, before that was Leviathan. Um, there was Which another I also card, like, loved, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, like, the, there's a long history of, like, uh, like uh, Krakens and those kind of creatures in, yeah. in blue that have drawbacks. It's funny because I think that, like, I was still very much a Timmy right? Which is, I just liked big splashy stuff, but I was like just smart enough to understand that blue was cooler than the other color. So I went for the big splashy blue creatures. <laughs> I wasn't quite there, but yeah, that, you know, those types of cards were, were really cool, but the, the clever people, they were playing a much different type of card. And one of the best examples that I've ever seen of, of cleverness in the earlier stages is illusions of grandeur, which is three in a blue enchantment. And this is a time when this is a card where you get to use cumulative upkeep against your opponent. So the cumulative upkeep is two mana. So it's a lot. It's two, then four, then six. I mean, you know, you, you're going to run out of time very, very quickly to be able to pay for it. So what do you get? Well, when it comes into play, you gain 20 life. So you would play this card and gain the 20. So that's great. But when it leaves play, you lose 20 life. And the key here is the you, and the you is the controller of the enchantment. So when you cast any ETBs on your side, you gain the 20 as the person who cast it. But what if there is a way to give this card to your opponent? And as it turns out, th there absolutely was, Luis. Yeah, a couple years later, uh, Donate got printed in Urza's Destiny. This is two to blue. Uh, target opponent gains control or permanent you control. And uh, what people ended up doing... Uh, is casting illusions of grandeur, gaining 20. So then they probably didn't die on the next turn, right? Mm -hmm. You gain 20 life. Your opponent probably attacks you for like five or 10 damage. You pay the upkeep and then you guys donate and give it to them. So not only are you up 20 life, which buys you a couple turns at the very least, now they have a, an illusions, which already has one counter on it. And next turn's going to have two. So they have to pay four mana. And then once they can't pay anymore, it goes away and they lose 20 life. Illusions donate was one of the one of the sickest combo decks and in fact it got really amped up i think when it, it got necro got added to it i think tricks was what was what it was originally called and all of a sudden people realized oh they could put necropotence in your blue combo deck with force of wills and then use dark rituals to cast these cards and then you have got a a turn three combo deck that also can counter a bunch of spells and draw a bunch of cards. And it was just an incredibly busted deck. Yeah. TBS. Isn't this one of the decks that Kai uh, used in his like original ascension to yes. the top of magic? Yeah, it, it, it was, it was, I trying to remember, it was definitely a pro tour in, um, Oh, what is it? Uh, uh, New Orleans, um, mm -hmm. where where he 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 didn't actually play the necro version. He played a, a blue, I think it was blue red donate, mm -hmm. um, and actually beat Tommy Wallamy to 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 win that pro tour. And it was you know it was essentially just turboing out illusions donate, um, like 
it, the, the combo was just so good because it gave you resilience with the illusions itself. The mm -hmm. if, if the 20 life wasn't part of it, I, I actually think this card would be much worse, obviously. But I, I, I think it's, it's very cool that you can kind of turn a, a, a negative into a positive um, with certain magic cards. So I think it's that's super cool. Um, and 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 there's a, there's a lot of kind of like cards in Ice Age that actually kind of turn those negatives into positives. I mean, uh, one of the cards I really really enjoy kind of building decks around was Jokel Hops. Oh um, yeah. This was like one of the very, very early, uh, like, get, uh, kind of red sweepers that killed everything. So, Joker Hops is like red, red four. It's a sorcery, and it's like bury all artifacts, creatures, and land. So, wipes the uh, ground of almost everything except enchantments. So, I often like paired it with something like Stormbind, even though obviously you need mana for Stormbind. But you know, you play two lands and you just like start binding your opponent because they 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 would have been reset and you could you could afford to do that. I don't think it's a good combo, but I remember kind of like building a lot of decks around that. And there was a lot of like decks around things like Nether Spirit with Joker Hops um, in in later sets. I like I, I think those kind of cards where you have like a seemingly very simple output, but actually it has quite quite a lot of layers of how the interaction works. Actually, speaking of simple outputs, uh, I want to read you maybe one of the most mind-blowing commons of all time, uh, Balduvian Shaman. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a common. It's blue for a 1-1 one, one cleric. Tap. Permanently change the text of target white enchantment you control that does not have cumulative upkeep by replacing all instances of one color word with another. For example, you may change counters black spells to counters blue spells. Balduvian Shaman cannot change mana symbols. That enchantment now has cumulative upkeep, one mana. <laughs> That's a common. So the joke with that one is that you you change circle of protections, which, by the way, all five circles of protection got reprinted in the set. So another not, cycle, as you mentioned, yeah. Not a great idea. Circles, I think, are fairly bad. Uh, but if you had a circle of protection red and you needed a circle of protection green, boom, Balduvian Shamans got your back. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, Ice Age was full of these ridiculous, ridiculous cards. And like, they had multiple cards that changed how lands tapped for mana. So they had Reality Twist, which is blue, blue, blue enchantment. It has cumulative upkeep of one blue, blue. So it actually has a three mana cumulative upkeep. It's not going to be around for too long. Instead of their normal mana, plains produce red, swamps produce green, mountains produce white, and forests produce black. So the other four land types that aren't blue now produce one of the enemy colors. But it has cumulative upkeep of you know three mana, so it's not around too long. There is Infernal Darkness. This is one of the ones you kind of mentioned half halfway, which is two black black for an enchantment, cumulative upkeep of one black mana and one life. So they're experimenting with life as a cumulative upkeep. All mana producing lands produce black instead of their normal mana. So anything that isn't a swamp basically now just taps for black mana. And <laughs> That makes it so, again, your opponent can't cast their spells. And they even had one more. They had a, an artifact, Naked Singularity. It's a five-mana artifact with cumulative upkeep of three. Instead of their normal mana, plains produce red, islands produce green, swamps produce white, mountains produce blue, and forests produce black. Good So God. let me ask you, how many cards that change your colors of mana that your lands tap for you need in a set? I would think the answer is zero. <laughs> I could maybe buy one. Three is... Three is outrageous. outrageous. Two of them have basically the same text. Oh, that's hilarious. And it's not intuitive or good text. One of my favorite early build arounds was printed in uh, in in Ice Age. <clears throat> I actually, uh, some number of years ago, I my mom said, "Oh, I found some of your old magic cards in the in the closet. You know, come grab them." And I did. And and the the cool well, there's two cool parts. One is that I had some type of weird affinity for Wasteland, even though I didn't play competitively. So I had like five of them and I was like, nice. sweet, mm. even though I don't know why, like that was, there was no reason for me to have them. And then, um, so that was cool. Thanks. You know, old me, young me, I guess. And then the other thing that I found were my deck boxes that I had put the decks that I had built in them. And I did not remember these. Like I didn't, I don't remember building these. I remember building a couple of the decks, but there was a lot that I didn't remember. And one of the deck boxes I picked up and I had written whatever name I had come up with for the deck on the deck box. And the deck was called Akhan's Run. 
And I was like, what the hell was that again? You know, and I, and I barely remembered it, but it's the, the flavor text on Lurgoyf is Ah, Hans run. It's the Lurgoyf. And that, by the way, was kind of cool because the, the quote, the person that that's quoting is Safi Eric's daughter. <laughs> Last words, it says, but that ended up being a magic card as well that they printed later. But Lurgoyf, you know, is one of those cards. It's very simple. It's two green, green for a star and then a one plus star. And it's stars are equal to number of creatures in all graveyards. So, you know, if there's four creatures, it's a four or five. And um, that, even though by modern design, that looks really simple and not very exciting. For the time, that was enough for me to say, oh, I can, I can, put, I can put a whole bunch of creatures in my deck and then I can play cards that'll get them in my graveyard. And... I'm, I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to play Lurgoyf and I'm going to kill people with Lurgoyf. Th this is obviously a terrible plan. Um, you know, it's a big vanilla creature or whatever. But that was where I was at. And I built an entire deck trying to do it, right? And on top of it, you know, Lurgoyf did end up spawning an entire long history of of spawn, <laughs> you know, that, that triggered off of different um, things like this. But, but, you know, even a simple card like Lurgoyf really captured my attention at the time. Um, and those type of build around cards that we take for granted now, uh, you know, they end up being really important to me because they were what I was interested in at the time for magic. Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. I, I, I think that's something is a bit lost, I think, with some of the modern designs is that you know, you have these cards that like you have no idea how you use, or they're just kind of like very simple in how the, you build around them. But but actually, the, there's so many different ways you can you can approach it. Um, but one card, I think, before we move on to alliances, mm -hmm. I, I, I basically wanted to cut like you know uh, after Louis said uh, the Balduvian shaman, I wanted people to kind of like hear ice cauldron. This is probably uh, oh, good call. An, yeah. ar an argument for the most complicated uh, effect that does absolutely nothing. Yes. Um, so Ice Cauldron is a four mana artifact, and here's the text of the card. Uh, X tap, put a charge counter on Ice Cauldron, and put a spell card face up on Ice Cauldron. Note the type and amount of mana used to pay the activation cost. Use this ability only if there are no charge counters on Ice Cauldron. You may play the spell card as if it was in your hand. Okay. Tap. <laughs> Remove charge counter from Ice Cauldron to add mana of the type and amount last used to put the charge counter on. Uh, so ch charge counter on Ice Cauldron to your mana pool. This mana is usable only to cast a spell on top of Ice Cauldron. So basically it's this kind of like weird mana battery. It uses literally 10 different lines of text and like I don't know how I'd ever really use it. <laughs> it's, it it's such a weirdo card that has almost no purpose do you, do you remember this card Luis? oh yeah i mean this even back then people <laughs> knew this was just outrageously dumb like <laughs> it's a four mana artifact where you basically let lets you pay in installments for a spell but you have to kind of put the spell on the ice collision now it says it exiles it uh but it's you know same thing and it's it's one of those things where it's like you know they, 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 we, we didn't have a reason not to do this. Well, you didn't really have a reason to do this. Yeah, like yeah. You, you were so preoccupied by whether you could, you would never ask yourself whether you should. Yeah. It's funny. Cause I remember this card as well. And I put it in decks <clears throat> and I just figured that since it was so complicated that it had to be doing something powerful, you know, and it, and really all it did is kind of fix your mana and delay your spell. <clears throat> there, there was a, a minor, uh, controversy, about one of the cards, uh, Icy Manipulator got reprinted in Ice Age. And oh, yeah. that's a four mana artifact. It's a classic. You might be rec recognize this one. Four mana artifacts, you pay one tap to tap, tap target artifact creature or land. This is unique in that this was a card in Alpha and Beta and Unlimited that w didn't make it into Revised and was a fairly expensive card. And it got reprinted in Ice Age as an uncommon. Mm. And uh, – not only that, but to add insult to injury, the flavor text calls it the bone crank. So that's you know that 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 that, that that's already kind of uh, taking icy manipulator down a peg. But this this was one of the first uh, sets where we saw a, a, a high profile reprint. And you know when when Kurt Ape got reprinted and revised, no one really batted an eye. 
Icy Manipulator getting reprinted in uh, Ice Age, which obviously makes sense. It's called Icy Manipulator. Right. You know, but it it, it made a lot of people mad because their, you know, $50 Icy's were now worth quite a bit less. It's also like a crappier art art version than the original. And like there was, it was just, yeah, a lot. That That's a... That's something that uh, people had to start to get used to. And, and, you know, the first time that that happens, you're definitely not used to it yet. Um, but yeah, the one last card I did want to talk about, because I remember it being a big part of combo decks as well was Zurin Orb, which is another one of those cards that looks really awful at first sighting. But if you, you know, combo it correctly, it can do great things. It's zero mana for an artifact and it, you can pay zero mana to sacrifice a land and gain two life. And, you know, at, at first glance, that looks like, you know, just an absolutely horrendous card. But that actually ended up being a, a powerful combo piece, right? Oh, not yeah. Just a, yeah, but not even just a powerful combo piece. People put it in every deck. Oh, every, every single deck. one. Every single deck. Because it's this free, not, right? Yeah, it's, it's free. <laughs> there was this perception that, like, at the very least, like, you can just, you know, like, if you're playing against, like, an aggro deck, you can, and you can just sack some land at the end to buy you an extra turn. Um, but I mean, the combo piece that you're talking about, like the, the biggest combo piece was uh, balance. So uh, this was at a time where there were actually still restricted cards in type two or what is modern uh, known as, as standard. So you could actually play one balance and one zero and all, both were restricted. The way you do it is you play your balance and then you'd sack all your lands to, to, the, to the balance so that when balance resolved, you'd have no, no land um, and usually no creatures. And and your opponent have to sack all their lands and all their creatures as well. And you you, you generally play some sort of artifact mana, usually Felwar Stone or something else like that. Mm. But the the, the the point was that the, the, that combo was so potent that people put that into the the deck when the, even when the, the the deck didn't really revolve around that because that was how powerful it was. It's a Wrath and an Armageddon in one kind of like package. Yeah. And it's funny because this does, of course, reflect on like the relative misunderstanding about cards and how to evaluate them and stuff too. You know, this has the the ornithopter problem where, you know, people assume that cards like this were free. <clears throat> they they did never put a value on the opportunity cost of putting a Zurin orb into your deck and therefore having it in your hand sometimes. They only said, Well, it doesn't cost any mana, so it's free, you know, so why not? Pretty cool. Um, okay, let's talk about alliances before we wrap up here. Um, this was the companion set to this, and this what well, effectively made like the first block, right? Yeah, I mean, like it, it, it was a direct sequel to to Ice Age. Was uh, designed by the same group of playtesters as Ice Age. Um, at the time, kind of like not all the sets were actually done at Wizard Central, and this was actually at East uh, Coast USA. Uh, like group of, of play testers and a lot of the themes carried over and honestly i think it's like one of the most exciting sets i remember kind of like seeing at the time it was like because every card felt really powerful in alliances at the time i like i was really really kind of captured by that and and the idea of a sequel set that was actually really really fun at the time too i mean obviously nowadays i mean we return to return to return to ravnica every few years but i think at the time this was like a really really big innovation I mean, you if you look at the Alliance's card file, these cards are all bangers. Like, there there are misses, of course, but it's not close to Ice Age when it comes to how many cards in Ice Age are non-functional, completely baffling, <laughs> really just completely unappealing. <laughs> alliances doesn't have that. I'm not saying Alliances is perfect, but Alliances actually has, like, a really high hit rate of, like, if you put these cards in your deck and you don't even know what you're doing, the cards do something. Mm. Ice Age did not clear that bar. You could make a deck full of Ice Age cards that accomplish nothing. Alliances actually has some like pretty cool cards in it. And I think Alliances was a good set and had some actually really cool chase cards. Uh, I mean, the biggest card in Alliances now and then is Force of Will, like in terms of its footprint. It wasn't actually the most valuable card, but it was a card that even the even the kind of bad players like me knew was good when the good players would describe to us why mm -hmm. it was good. And then when you got your spell Force of Will and they had no mana, you're like, wow, amazing. Yeah. So that's a, you know, I can't believe I'm even reading the text of Force of Will, but it's three blue, blue for uh, a counter spell, you, you know, counter target spell. And you can 
pay a life and remove a blue card in your hand from the game instead of paying its casting cost. It's on the short list. It, it's one of the cards I've cast the most in my entire life. Mm-hmm. I think I think Force of Will probably cracks the top five for me if I had to guess. I've just played Force of Will and Vintage and Legacy for you know over and over and over and over again. It's it's actually really stood the test of time as not I would say the most fair card in the world. Like I wouldn't want this to get reprinted in standard, for example. I think that would be that would not be a, a desirable thing. But you are getting two for one. They actually kind of understood well enough that like, hey, if this is a super powerful effect, but you get two for one. Can we do this? And I think Force of Will has been a huge positive for the game. Yeah, I, I think it's actually a net positive for the formats that are still available. In. Totally. It like I, I think if you did, if you remove Force of Will from those formats, just like just banned it, let's say it would make those formats noticeably worse. Um, even though I, I, I think the formats are now kind of warped around Force of Will, so it's 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 weird because because I, I totally agree with Luis. I don't think it's kind of a, a card for modern Magic, but I think for super powerful old Magic, it's necessary because you need to have points of interaction and nearly every interactive point in those those kind of like big formats is on turn one and two, and so therefore you don't actually have a lot of time to set up. And so things like free spells are really, really important. W- wasn't it part of a cycle? It, it was. So The other uh, ones were just as popular long-term, right? I mean, everybody's still... <laughs> well, funnily enough, the, the, every now and then they pop up. So the other cards uh, in the cycle are Contagion from uh, Black. It's three Black Black. You can uh, you know exile a Black card and, and pay a life. Though, funnily enough, not all of them required paying a life. That's the additional balancing knob that Force of Will and Contagion had. I think the other three actually don't have it. Um, funny. And uh, what it does is put a minus two, minus one counter on up to two target creatures. <laughs> That's pretty good. So yeah. ki- ki- kind of nonsensical. Uh, Bounty of the Hunt is the green one. Uh, they all they all cost five mana, though. Again, it's not consistent. Bounty of the Hunt costs three green, green. And uh, you put three plus one, plus one counters on any number of creatures, but you remove the counters end of turn. So it's not even... The full on like giant growth, or so it's giant growth. It's not. It doesn't give you counters forever. Uh, red is pyrokinesis. This costs six mana, so it's four red red. Doesn't cost you a life though. You can just exile a red card, instant, and it deals four damage divided any way you choose among creatures. So this card every now and then saw legacy play though. I guess fury is a lot better than that now. And then the white one was scars of the veteran. This is four and a white. So little these minor differences across the whole cycle. You remove a white card from your hand to play it, prevent up to seven damage to target creature or player. For each one damage prevented by Scars of the Veteran, put a plus one, zero plus one counter on that creature at end of turn. So, okay. yeah, I mean, <clears throat> Bounty of the Hunt saw little play. Contagion and Pyrokinesis saw moderate to, to decent amounts of play. And then no one ever put Scars of the Veteran in a deck, really. But Force of Will saw tons and tons and tons and tons of play. They did play. They they did print um, uh, Elvish Spirit Guide, right? Speaking of, you know, just yeah, turning so cards into resources. It's showing that they're comfortable with playing with exiling as a cost and and, and trading again cards for speed. So this is a two and a green for a two two, but it, you can exile it from your hand to add a green to your mana pool. Yeah. And it's a really cool card. This card, generally, just like Simeon Spirit Guide only shows up in complete nonsense decks like you're not the, the, you know these don't show up in in decks that are are fair because trading a card for a mana one time is generally not a good deal in a fair deck but i think that elvish spirit god is a really cool card to print and i remember it captivating a lot of people and i don't really recall it going too wrong back then certainly not now yeah i, I remember no, I, it, go ahead ben no no it, it, it was a, it was a card that basically n- didn't show up at all in like in a small card pool, and early Magic was basically a small card pool. It just wasn't good enough compared to like you know playing a turn one land or elf. Like you, you know, why would I like you know invest a card when I could just like invest a mana and get it for the rest of the game? Right. But um, like all these cards, like some of there's a class of cards that basically get worse with big um, or get better 
in this case, but get worse from a design uh, standpoint with big card pools. And this is the, one of them that does, where eventually there's going to be enough ways to kind of abuse free mana that you're going to actually have to ban these cards. And that's what happened to Simeon's Spirit Guide, and that's what happens to uh, Elder Spirit Guide too. Yeah, you know, also one interesting thing that starts to pop up is cards like Gorilla Shaman, which kind of look backwards a bit, right? They're they're kind of aimed at the early cards like the Moxin and stuff. Gorilla Shaman's red for a 1-1, one, one, and you can pay X, X, and 1 to destroy target non-creature artifact with casting cost equal to X. So like for a Mox, it's zero. So you just pay one mana to destroy a Mox, for example. If you want to destroy a three mana, or excuse me, a one mana artifact, it costs you three. Um, but these were, you know, coming in to destroy a lot of the broken stuff that people were doing from from prior sets. Like, you know, you weren't blowing up people's gestures cap with this thing. N- no, in, in fact, this this card was called immediately Mox Monkey. Um, yeah. It would, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. it tell, tells you exactly what people had in their minds. <laughs> yeah. This card still sees some popper play, though. I guess uh, now that Atog got banned and the new artifact lands got printed, probably less. But yeah, Mox Monkey was was a standout and uh, definitely did a lot of cool stuff. Alliance has also had a, a a bunch of really powerful lands. It's actually funny of the so they have uh, eight non basic lands in the in in the set. Five are part of a cycle, and so what the cycle is is lands that make you sacrifice a land in, when they come into play. One for each color. So, uh, Kajeldur and Outpost was definitely the strongest of these. It was a it was a land that you have to sack a planes or bury it when you play it. It taps for a white. But you can pay one a white and tap and put a 1-1 soldier into play. And Outpost was just a, a staple for a lot of these control decks where you just play an Outpost. You, you you do lose a plane, so you're kind of down a land. But this just sits there and makes creatures at, at very low cost. And, I mean, if Castle Ardenvale was legal back then, it would be so much better. But yeah. Outpost was really strong, especially in formats you know where there wasn't much uh, in the way of land destruction. This is even before Wasteland got printed. And uh, – the other lands in the cycle, there's some strong ones too, like Lake of the Dead. I love this one. Oh, I love uh, that card too. Cool when you art. play it, uh, you have to sack a swamp, taps for a black, or you can tap and sack a swamp to add four black mana to your mana pool. And it really turbocharged you at a cost. It's kind of like – it continues it with, alongside Dark Ritual. Black had this identity of like fast mana temporarily, which they've kind of moved away from. But uh, Lake of the Dead was that. And then a weird one is Soul Devi Excavations. They Every now and then – they have these like diversions from the cycle where the red and blue ones make you sack an untapped land of their type, but they tap for two mana instead. Mm. So the excavation, you have to sack an untapped island, but this taps for one and a blue. And you can pay one and tap it and look at the top card of your deck and you can put it on the bottom. It lets you scry one. And again, I mean, the problem is the blue white control decks would just play the outpost instead of excavations, but this wasn't a weak card either. If you're in a world where people aren't blowing up your lands, this doesn't even cost you a land drop like no. the other ones. Yeah. And all of a sudden, it, it, again, this is just Castle of Antris. I guess these are just the precursors to, to those two lands. <laughs> I mean, th- these cards were genuinely exciting at the time. Like it was oh, like yeah. util- utility lands, like – there's a, a few of them in, in other sets, but like this is the first kind of like set of utility lands that you could really use in kind of the type two format that was getting pushed at the time. Uh, for me, a, a cool card that that's like pretty memorable is Feldegriff. Uh, for those people who don't know, this oh, actually yeah. was named after uh, Richard Garfield. It, it, it's it's actually an anagram of Garfield PhD, mm-hmm. um, and so Feldegriff is a one colorless, white, blue, green, summon uh, Feldegriff. I guess it's it's summon legend on the original card, but it's I think it's summon Feldegriff, uh, legendary Feldegriff. Anyway, it's one white, flying until end of turn, target opponent gains two life. One blue, uh, bounce it to your hand, and a target opponent can draw a card. Or one green, uh, trample, and you can put a hippo token uh, to it at target op- opponent's control. And it's a 4-4. So it's a 4-4-4-4, four, 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 which back then was a great set of stats. Yeah. And then it had these kind of like negatively costed powers. But actually, altogether, it was actually a, actually a pretty good card. Um, I, again, I wouldn't say it was like the most powerful card, but it was actually super cool at the time. And it was really weird looking because it's a purple elephant. Uh, pur- purple elephant. 
for purple flying hippo. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you guys remember Helm of Obedience? Oh, yes. Yeah, this, this is a card that I remember from back then as well. It's a four mana artifact that you can pay X and tap it to uh, mill target opponent for X or mill them a card. Then repeat that process until a creature card or X cards have been put into their graveyard this way, whichever comes first. If one or more creature cards were put into that graveyard this way, you sacrifice the helm and put one of them onto the battlefield under your control and X can't be zero. So this card is much more well known in modern times because it combos with uh, either rest in peace or Leyline of the void right to for a single kill because like <clears throat> helm basically looks for cards that go to the graveyard those cards mean that the cards don't go to the graveyard so eventually uh, it just mills out your opponent basically for the low cost of one mana once it's in play right so that's that's the coolness. I, I remember this card being very popular back then because it was like, oh, I could mill out a control deck because they don't have creatures. Generally, they they did something else to, to kill you. But honestly, this card was it was just a cool design. Yeah, um, and it was I don't know. This, this is a lot of kind of cool um, uses and history with this card. Yeah, what, what about- I remember this thinking it was just an awesome card. It was just. You don't. It, it combines a couple things. Taking their card really appealing. You don't know what you're going to get. You could get a Juzum Jin or a Shivan Dragon or something really powerful. So this like random output. And then, you know, even if you're you're missing against creatureless decks, you just mill them out so fast. So the Alliance has had a lot of these kind of masterpieces. Like I, Setting aside the Leyline combo, I think that's kind of nonsense. That's just like some of these really ancient cards have bizarre templating. That shouldn't work. There's no way that should – like that doesn't make any logical sense, right? But <laughs> – when you, you look at, you know, Helm of Obedience as like, did this captivate people's hearts and minds? It certainly did. There's a, And Alliances has a, such a higher hit rate. Like, let me read you one of my favorites, which is an awful card, Lord of Tressorhorn. <laughs> oh, <is> yeah. <laughs> one blue, black, red. So one plus Grixis mana for a 10-4. Four, four mana, 10-4. That was in Alliances. I did not remember that. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> When it comes into play, you have to pay two life, sack two creatures, and the opponent draws two cards. <laughs> it also has regeneration for one black mana. So yeah, again, not a good card. A four mana 10-4 regenerate is, is pretty solid, but they get to draw two cards. You have to sack two creatures and even pay two life. But it doesn't matter. This is a four mana 10-4. This is such a cool card. How can you stop Lord of Tressorhorn? I'll put some creatures in, into play to sacrifice to this. Easy. <laughs> And alliances, like if you look at all the gold cards and alliances, I would say that like of the of the ten, like seven or eight of them are awesome. Mm. It's it's I mean, wandering mage, this like Esper cleric that has a bunch of ways to prevent damage. Really cool misfortune, the jund sorcery that you know your opponent uh, either gets a plus one plus one creature on, either lets you put a plus one plus one creature on each creature you control and gain four life or minus one, minus one on all their creatures and they lose four life. And these cards are just so cool. We'll, we'll ignore the, 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 the red, green, white one that in, involves snow covered lands or whatever. But, you know, I, I, like I said, a ton of these cards are great. Yava Maya ants, four mana, five, one trample with cumulative upkeep and haste. Like these cards are just solidly great cards. And I don't know how different the team was that worked on ice age versus alliances, but alliances is so much better. Yeah, so do, the same exact remember, people. But yeah. do you remember what the most exciting card the, for the community was coming into alliances? I mean, it had to be Balduvian Horde, right? It was Balduvian Horde. <laughs> Balduvian Horde was like had so much hype around it. So Balduvian Horde is like red, red two for a five, five. So that's a pretty good stat line, especially considering the stats back then. Um, a lot of people call this the the, the new Chuzam. And basically, when it came into play, you had to discard a card. This card had so much hype, people thought it was going to be unbeatable because it was just like, you know, people had memories of like Juzam Jin being so good. This card was not very good, at least at the time. Um, actually, probably not good now too. But like it's it's so funny that the majority of the early cards that people were hyped about in, in Magic sets just end up to be complete flops. This is very, very true for many, many cards in early Magic sets. I think in modern times, people have a better sense of like what the good cards are but th like early on i would say that it was like more likely than not that they actually would get it wrong than get it right 
Yeah, ter- ter- terror is a heck of a card. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just a little rough when you're trying to two for one yourself to get some big terrorable creature on the on the battlefield. Any other cards that you want to hit from alliances before we kind of wrap up here? I, I just want to shout out to uh, to Mashi. Uh, his favorite card is also oh, pillage, in the set. of course. <laughs> yes, I think pillage is awesome. I like this is one of my favorite cards in magic and definitely in alliances so it's red red one sorcery buried target artifact or land one it's like super simple right so it's it's kind of like disenchant level simple um and it like was like two outputs actually sometimes you wanted like either so i I think it's pretty cool but i think what really really takes the cake is the art is amazing i mean richard kane ferguson is great (laughs) artist but this is actually one of his best so like i would say that pillage is I mean, I don't want to kind of like give Mashi too many props, but this card is a good card to have as your favorite card. <laughs> Pretty cool choice. And it did come out in alliances. So let's zoom out a little bit as we wrap up here. So it sounds like you guys are really pretty big fans of alliances in general. They hit a lot of really powerful stuff and it was a bit more compact of a set. <clears throat> What's the legacy left behind from both Ice Age and uh, alliances? You know, when we look back at, at how they maybe changed the game change the designs, change the way that we did set set type of stuff? For me, it's about structure. I think Ice Age and Alliances really shows what kind of like a, a lot of planning and forethought with this set structure, like having a, a, a lot of the nuts and bolts stuff, having a lot of uh, like cycles and themes. I, like I, I would say that as we've mentioned, Ice Age has a lot of poor power balancing and 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 focus and alliances is good in that way but like regardless of those things like the structure of these sets is actually pretty modern thinking and i think that's really really important because i think you know you'll see this in uh, mirage and i think mirage is even a a a kind of step ahead of of uh thinking when it comes to uh, magic set structure um but this is really really kind of like represents a turning point in how they approach magic and a lot of the sets are designed in similar ways i mean obviously you know the thinking has grown since since then but they got a lot right when it comes to structure here what about you louise i totally agree i think that ice age i think it's an a in uh like a in structure and philosophy and an f minus in execution i think it's actually (laughs) kind of hard to do worse than ice age in terms of the individual card designs but it was a it was a trailblazing set in terms of what Magic needed to do to get to where it is now, whereas Alliances I think similarly has a, a very strong uh, structure and it's you know using those lessons from Ice Age, but actually has like a solid like A minus execution for kind of the, the the time back then. So it's hard to separate the two really in any meaningful way, so, especially so. They're kind of going to be bundled together, but the individual card quality of design is much higher in alliances. And overall, I think both were an important step forward for Magic in a way that some of the sets back then really weren't. You know, you look at Homelands or you look at uh, the Antiquities. I don't think those are really – I think those were like actively bad for Magic. Fall, yeah. I think even Fallen Empires, I know that we talked about the good and the bad with that. You can go back and listen to that episode. I don't think Fallen Empires did a great job of advancing Magic, whereas – I think Ice Age Alliances certainly did. And of course, you know, talked at length about Alpha. I think at least Arabian and Legends sh- showed the cool space of magic in ways that were, were valuable. And Ice Age and Alliance did kind of the opposite, which is it sh- it gave magic designers structure and expectations of what to c- they should do next, even if maybe the execution wasn't the, the, the tippity top. Yeah, great stuff, guys. This was really fun to uh, to look back at what was a massive set, you know, uh, impact wise and also just raw card size for the time. You know, I think that if you talk to a lot of people that were there, you know, when magic was hitting that first really big peak of popularity, you will find that they have a lot of ice age cards still in some dusty box in the uh, closet. You know, everybody hopes to find the really great stuff, you know, from alpha beta and et cetera. But, you know, I can't imagine how many card stores, have had somebody come in and say, I've got my old magic collection from when I was young and I'm looking to sell it. And they go, okay, one time, give me all those beta cards. And it's a ton of ice age and alliances every time. This is uh, a set that was really, really popular, sold a 
trillion of, and uh, there's still a bunch of these cards uh, around out there. Anyway, great stuff, guys, as always. And uh, it was really fun to walk down memory lane. We're going to call it an episode there. First, I want to say thank you to TBS for coming on. Um, TBS, what are you up to? Um, you got anything you want to let people know about? Where can they find you? That kind of thing? No, so what? Well, nothing Nothing going right this, this second, but actually I'm, I'm kind of have a few things in the in, in the fire. So you may see some, some content coming from me pretty soon. Okay. Uh, but you can find me easily on Twitter at, at TBS Dash. Great. Thanks again for coming on TBS. It's always a pleasure to have, have you on and we'll see you on for the next one. I don't know what sets up next, but, uh, but when it comes around, you, you Mirage. is Mirage next? I think so. Oh my God. Great. Mirage is not to spoil too much. One of the all time great sets in magic. So I'm really yes. looking forward to talking about it. Oh, that's fantastic. I love that. Also, uh, implications for limited too. So really cool. Uh, we'll be looking forward to that one. <clears throat> if you want to find, uh, us on social media, I'm Marshall underscore LR and Luis is LSV. You can find everything related to the podcast over at LRcast.com. And, uh, of course, I want to mention our sponsors, channelfireball.com. Make sure that you check out CFB Pro as well as the new marketplace over there and uh, FTX, FTX.us inside the U.S. and FTX.com outside for any of your uh, cryptocurrency, NFT, digital asset needs. Uh, make sure that you, uh, you check them out. They're the place to go. That's going to do it for this episode. We'll see you next week. So, Marshall, this last week I uh, dipped my toes into another game, as, as I know you saw. <laughs> I, I did. Uh, I started to uh, I started to play some chess. So what what happened is uh chess.com invited me to play in a little tournament style thing, uh Winner Stays, where I played against one other streamer. Uh her her name was Crybaby Carly. She's a variety slash chess streamer. And we played three different formats. We played uh three minute game five minute games, three minute games, and one minute games in a certain amount of time of each. Uh you know, long story short or maybe short story short, uh, I got demolished. She was, she was much better than me, but that, that wasn't a huge surprise. I had literally been playing for a week. I do have previous chess experience, but this is like from high school. This is many, many, many years ago. And I certainly had never played any of these like really fast games, but it, it's been a lot of fun kind of getting into chess and playing, playing games online. I have it on my phone now, so I'll play games every now and then. And one of the, one of the, the cool things is just me thinking about like, I can't help but think what happened if I played chess instead of magic? You know, I'm not, Why not I'm not in any way regretful of, of the direction I went, but I, it certainly is plausible that I could have gotten as into chess, if not for magic. I mean, magic's what made me stop playing chess originally mm. where I was in the chess club playing chess in high school. And then magic was like, uh, actually, this is like a lot more appealing to me. I think I'd rather do this, but chess is a cool game. I've started to watch some, uh, some, some chess on Twitch and, you know, we'll see. I'm probably not going to hit it too hard, not as much as when I was like preparing for my little tournament. But it's cool dipping my toes into a new set of puzzles to solve and strategies to to take a look at. And yeah, chess has some, has some really cool stuff going for it. So it, it actually is a surprisingly streamable game. And uh, I don't know. It's been it's been fun. It's been fun exploring chess. Though it is funny that there's a as, unlike Magic, there's a lot of people in my chat who are much, much better than me at chess. That's just generally not the case, you know, uh, when I'm playing Magic. So you, you get to see a lot of my blunders on full display when I've streamed chess. I'll wait for the next expansion to start playing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the rooks are, are, are OP in this one, so we, we, we know they need a little balancing. <laughs>